Welcome everyone to the Boswell virtual event series where uh, humble booksellers like myself get to chat with their favorite authors. Uh, my name is Rachel and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today is day 4,933 of Boswell being in business. Our author today has written several books um, and then the latest is of course the one we're talking about today. They have a degree in world literature, mythology and folklore, something that we need to talk about. Um, thank you so much for being here today, Alexandra Rowland. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to your pages and pages of questions. <laughs> Have them, yes. Uh, single spaced, uh, but Times New Roman 12 point font, of course. I'm I was about to ask. I was about to ask what point font it was. <laughs> this, I don't know, Calibri automatically. And I was like, ugh, no, cannot. cannot <laughs> Not, <there>. no. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, A Taste of Golden Iron, as I told you right beforehand, um, we read this book in like a sort of chain reaction. And I think you'll appreciate this because I hope this has been your experience, maybe if you've talked to other booksellers, but because uh, the book made the Indie, ne Indie Next list. And yes. I have to imagine it was because of what happened at my store. Uh, just as <laughs> awesome. Parker, uh, my favorite person in the world, came up to me and said, there's this book, uh, I think you might like it. It's gay, it's got romance. Um, I think it has silver in the title. <laughs> which of course it did not uh we found it on eight away like classic classic bookseller experience i think it has silver or something in the title there's a metal you know sure and yeah. we found it remarkably by searching silver on edelweiss i don't know how but um it came up and i tell you i'm not lying i'm pretty sure this is true i read it i started reading it that night because i downloaded it on my laptop and i finished it the next day Almost amazing weekly. And then um, I was putting it on my stories. Uh, so Ollie, uh, who also works at the store, saw this and was like, how dare you? I don't want to read romance, but I'm going to read this. Uh, so they read it. And then yada, 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 we made Jenny and Margaret read it. Everyone loved it. So I'm just here to say thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful to hear that. Um, especially from like indie booksellers, because you guys are like out here doing the work and are the like backbone of the industry in many ways. Um, like with all of those complicated or like those those difficult questions when people come in, like I think it has silver in the title and it was really gay. What was that? Um, so thank you, thank you so much for for um, like being an advocate for it, and uh, I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. Oh, absolutely! It uh, it really did. Um capture my imagination in a way that I hadn't quite seen yet mm. this year. I, I can't remember when I actually read it now, but I think it was maybe in May. And mm. um, since then, it kind of put me on the path toward reading a whole bunch of books that I would say are like either queer norm or uh, just fantasy or sci-fi in some way that just um, were all about this, like a relationship of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, I've been reading a lot of romance and I would say in my mind, this is a romance. I don't know how you feel like you personally as the author. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would put sort of like, it's kind of equal weighted between fantasy and romance, right? Um, I think structurally speaking, um, just like the shape of the plot, it's probably a little bit more on the, romance side rather than the fantasy side um the because the fantasy is there in the setting and the magic system but it's the the relationship which is what we're here for right mm -hmm. and um it's like that's kind of the load-bearing part of the plot yes absolutely but i have to say like if if i were to describe this as a, a romance solely, I feel like I would do such a disservice to the story. Mm -hmm. uh, first time reading it, I was dazzled by the romance and that's all I thought about. But second time reading it, and I read it very, like very recently again, um, I was struck by how much layered world building you had. If yes. I may, we've got a government slash monarchy slash like sultancy system we've got um the 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 is it Kyalar is that how you would pronounce it Kyalar Kyalar okay, gotcha. so the Kyalar we've got um and their whole system of 
how they operate. Uh, you've got currency, we've got magic of multiple varieties, including sea ser serpents, which is amazing. Um, we've got uh, gender, sexuality, degrees of paternity, and that's just in this particular country that we're in. We've mm -hmm. got a whole religion that is engaged in throughout the story and it's not just like a thin veil. We've got um, a hilariously confusing method of telling time in the book. Which yes. I love well, so the, like, like not so much telling time for anyone who hasn't read it yet. Um, we might talk about spoilers, just be warned. Um, but the the ways that they count their their calendar, like the calendar epics, um, it's like dynastic uh, their their year system. But the dynasties overlap because like the current like every dynasty counts from the birth of the first ruler, but the previous dynasty doesn't end until the dynasty is actually overthrown. And I I loved that. I loved sort of building that in because that kind of messiness is so it's so real and so human, right? I think a lot of, um, like sometimes in fantasy, there's a, a temptation to make things really tidy and to like get all your stuff sorted out just so and everything fits together like just just right. Um, but in actuality, like humans are, are messy and, and systems are imperfect and there's reasons for doing things. Um, and so like with this calendar epic system that is overlapping and messy, like which, um, like the decision of how to date a year in an ambiguous period is kind of a political decision in, in many ways. Like, are you emphasizing the fact that like you're talking about this dynasty or this other dynasty? Like what it's, it's it shows that there's like, personal individual reasons and motivations for like using a tool right rather than just having it be like a sort of bloodless system absolutely and i, I love that it was the the idea of, of sucking up to the current dynasty where they might yeah that, even though they're not talking about that dynasty at all it right. and it kind of struck me as um like that's you must have pulled that maybe from like egyptian or Babylon, you know, like it that seems like a, a thing that people used to do at one point. Um, I I know that there are cultures that have used dynastic systems for their like calendar epics. Um, I'm not personally familiar with one that is messy in this in the way that this one is. Okay. Um, although because usually, usually those are like it's it's more neatly separated. Like when the dynasty was overthrown um, is the end of of one sort of section, and then when the new dynasty was instituted um, is the that next section. Um, I'm certain that there are cultures that have had that overlap, mm -hmm. um, but I think that was something that I just sort of like pulled from the ether. <laughs> um, I, which I love. <laughs> right. And like, sometimes, sometimes that happens because like a lot of my world building is very much based in, in logic. Right. And like, what's sort of like the human way to do things. What's the thing that makes sense here. Um, and, and so sometimes like I have gotten um, people from, for example, with my first book, A Conspiracy of Truths, um, I have a, or I had at that, that point, a friend who was in law school um, and she was extremely interested in this whole legal system, which made so much sense to her. And it was blowing her mind. I was like, I literally just made that up. I just made that up because it sounded like it made sense to me. She was like, yes, oh my God, it does make sense. Um, so like, I, I, I really like that kind of very, you take a seed of something and then you kind of like logically extrapolate from yeah. it. Yeah, I read, um, now I can't remember which interview you did, but um, I read that and it really reminded me of um, reading your version, this politics and government system, all that really reminded me of Tamara Pierce um, and the way Thank you so she, much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Because um, because her her world of Tortal, um, and of course she's had what decades now to develop mm. it. But um, I'm I've always been so in awe of how she's able to layer in different cultures and customs and make those two interact or two or yes. three or however many cultures and customs. 
uh, it's so much fun. So reading this book really did give me um, those vibes. Like I'm, yeah, it was like Becca Cooper for me um, <laughs> of her series. Well, well, all of my all of my fantasy books are set in the same world, so I'm kind of doing a similar thing on on that level. Um, and I've been working on this since, uh, like, I started doing the world building for this in finals week of my last semester of college ten years ago. Uh, so I, I find that it's it's one of those things where, like, the the deeper you dig, the more rich and nuanced it gets. Um, and the, the more sort of detail you can dig into, um, uh, it's, I'm just now starting to get to a point where readers who are really sharp eyed can start noticing links between books, um, in like separate series. Um, for example, the inciting incident of a taste of golden iron was mentioned in, uh, a choir of lies and the nation of Arash has been mentioned in both choir and uh, c a conspiracy of truths and you know this sort of nonsense I'm I'm having fun and hopefully like other people will will also be having fun when we've gotten to a point where they can like see the scope of what I'm doing <laughs> um, but we yeah we, we haven't quite gotten to the point where like you can start putting those those pieces together there's a couple yeah. big things that are are still missing. What a great like tapestry you're weaving too then to um and why not you know if you're doing all this work to build a world why not use it in multiple different like perspectives I love that. Yeah yeah I mean and like I I think there's like I don't want to like throw my colleagues under the bus right but like I really like the sort of fantasy where you can see to the horizon but then also that you have the sense that there's something beyond the horizon um rather than feeling like the world stops at the boundaries of that country that you're currently in a, you don't want the the floating island effect of like once right. you leave the coast it's just it's all water after that right <laughs> and you certainly don't get that with this one because i mean we've got um tastes of I mean, it seems like uh, the, the vintage people are probably French, you know, you've got like this idea of, of like a whole and a really different culture to um, what we've got here. Uh, we definitely feel that. Um, if, if I were to, I'm definitely going to, if I'm going to go back and read previous books of yours in any particular order, um, do you recommend starting at the first book you've written or is there one that's more closely connected to this book that I should start with? Um, this one isn't closely connected to any of them yet. Um, and since they're all sort of like in their own distinct series, like we haven't had any character crossover yet. Uh, yet. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so you could read them like pretty much in whatever order, depending on like what vibes you're looking for. Um, like if you're looking for dapper theater lesbians, uh, having a like Shakespeare in love meets West Side Story kind of uh, drama situation, and then they commit some arson, um, start with uh, Some by Virtue Fall. If you really like um, like stories about the power of stories and political intrigue and like like nation scale stakes, then I would recommend A Conspiracy of Truths. Um, but yeah, it sort of like depends on what your vibes of the moment are. Okay, cool. I will, I, will, I can work with that. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, to uh, this bullet point list that I had of all the different things that you put into this book is so big. I still have more, <laughs> too, which is so cool. Um, I love that there's, uh, uh, I mean, this is kind of a dumb moment, but there's language specific to all of this. And mm -hmm new language and specific language and then on top of that we've got a romance and a whodunit let's not forget that mm -hmm. um and so much character development i i saw that you did multiple drafts drafts of this was it six or seven do we know yes. um, um either six or seven it depends on how you count really yeah. okay that's fair um well i'm not surprised to hear it because it feels like you did the work to make all of this coherent and whole. Um, so yay. Thank <laughs> you. Me fawning over you. I, I don't know if you knew that or not, but 
<laughs> oh no, oh dear, being fawned over, what shall I do? Um, and I assume that your your degree in what uh, liter world literature, mythology, and folklore ha mm -hmm. has a lot to do with um, all of your writing. Uh, yeah, for, for sure. Um, just sort of like in the ways in which I'm aware of the stories that people tell and the ways in which they tell them. And also the fact that things that you don't necessarily realize are stories are actually stories. Um, and then my minor was uh, in linguistics. I was like two classes away from an, a double major in uh, world literature, mythology, folklore, which is, was like one thing um, in the English department and um, like a double major in linguistics. And I think you can really see like the linguistics influence a lot in not just the fact that there are multiple languages, but in the ways in which those languages have um like one language might have a deficiency in something that another language doesn't like uh for example one of the characters Cyranos is from a, another country and his language just doesn't have the words to express the concepts that the Arashti language is expressing and so that's a source of like conflict and, and friction absolutely yeah, and I, oh, I, I love the um, the notion of a of a body father as opposed to, um, you know, oh, was it a love father or a, and a law? It's father? it's they have they have three types. It's body father, which is basically what it says on the tin, like the biological sire of the child. Um, law father, which is the the man who has legal claim. On the child and let's not get into the idea of claim because that's a whole different like com complicated concept um that has to do with their inheritance laws and like who gets to like have ownership of, of children basically um so uh body father law father and love father which and love father is sort of like the man who's in this child's life who is acting in the role of like partner to the mother that may or may not be like a sexual relationship um and in many cases it isn't right um like this could be a a boyfriend she dates later who doesn't have any legal claim on the child who was not involved in the creation of this child but who is still like an important part of this child's life um, and so since they have a matriarchal system, like I was just looking at like, well, how are they looking at paternity and how are they sort of, what's a different way than what we would usually expect for them to think about paternity? How can I make this like cool and, and different, but also like emphasizing something else about like the difference in how they perceive these things. Right. I, I love it too. Cause it's, uh, it's not like it's an alien concept, all of these things, but um, perhaps in Cyrano's country, it's just, that's just not how they do it and whatnot. I, I love that there's that um, degree of difference between the two. Mm. Um, I, okay, so. <laughs> Have we gotten to any of your actual questions? I'm sorry, I keep like interrupting to like, like explain my world building. <laughs> no, please do. I, I cannot tell you how much of a world building weirdo I am so please always well, do same <laughs> you know same a couple of questions and I I would say definitely we should get into spoilers maybe later in the um sure. event. so we'll we'll definitely talk about some stuff but um I I do have a question actually from Ollie who happens to be my co-worker um and they wanted to know uh, I've heard of different fantasy authors having different starting areas for their world building what aspect of the world um, you write in, did you start with, if there's one in particular? Um, so if we're talking about the world in general, mm -hmm. um, I definitely started with the environment. Like I started drawing like a map and like that was what I spent most of the last, the last week of, of finals on because mm -hmm. uh, being uh, like graduating with a degree in the English department meant that like most of my final projects were essays. So those were all done. I only had one like actual exam. You know how it goes. You know how it goes. Uh, <laughs> so I had one exam to study for and nothing else to do. So I just hung out in my dorm room and like drew this fantasy map and 
like researched ocean currents and different biomes and made sure that all of my uh, tectonic plates were working out properly and wind currents or like ocean currents, wind directions, like all the things. Um, because like when you get right down to it, like so much of culture is how people are interacting with their environment. Mm -hmm. And that is that plays such a, a huge role on it. Um, I also took a couple of anthropology classes in, in college and it was really fascinating to me to, or when the, the professor was talking about how the severity of weather that a culture experiences or the, the difficulty, the severity of weather and also just the general difficulty of life in this particular region affects what kind of gods those people have and like whether the gods are reliable and benevolent or whether they are sort of righteous and uh, punishing or whether they are erratic and unreliable and can't be reasoned with. Um, yeah, so like everything we do, like when you go all the way back to its origins, eventually comes back to like some interaction with the environment. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's so great. It's, it's like a, a thing that you, it's logical, it makes sense, but you not a lot of people really think about it you know yeah really engage in that a lot um so okay I want to get into a bit of specifics with the story um first thing I want to ask about the story um we have a split perspective uh narrative we've got uh Kado and Evermer is that right Kado and Evermer yes Kado, yeah and um I think, uh, you know, and you see this a lot, especially in romance novels uh, with the split narrative, but in this case, it makes so much sense because you've built into the story, um, this concept of not only um, fealty and feelings, which is something I've read about <laughs> in your interviews a lot, but also um, this uh, misperception that mm. happens throughout the book. Um, can you talk a little bit about, is, is that something that you set out to portray or did it just come, come about naturally? That one was a later development somewhere in the middle of the like six or seven drafts. Um, I needed a little bit more like texture and conflict and tension in the beginning. Um, so I started building in that it was going to be an enemies to lovers kind of situation. Um, because I needed some reason for them to not immediately to like have that kind of at least wariness and, and distance and, and guardedness from each other so that when eventually like they let down their walls and they become vulnerable to each other, um, it's more meaningful. Um, like you have to, you have to have those obstacles that they overcome to make the eventual, re eventual reward mean something. Mm -hmm. um so that was that was kind of where it, it came from but also like I K Kado is such an unreliable narrator because he I mean he has chronic anxiety and anxiety makes all of us unreliable narrators sometimes um speaking from personal experience um so I, I right like when you can't trust what's happening in your own brain even when you're trying mm -hmm. to be reliable it makes your life so much more difficult. Uh, and so having Evamer there as a counterbalance to, because he, except he's also an unreliable narrator in his own way, isn't he? Um, because like one of the the big obstacles is, as you said, like the, that perception of each other and that perception of the events that are, are happening. Um, yeah, it, it's, it was kind of like, a necessary tool in order to like give the reader a, a at least a chance at like having a semi-objective view of things like I didn't want the reader to be as much inside their heads as I have with other books I wanted them to be a step removed so that they could like watch the performance happen as if from like a, a theater seat and in, in like, or, like an audience seat in a theater. Yes, yes, yes. I had my popcorn. I was ready. Uh, yeah. Was it hard to was it hard to pace that? Because I um, another thing I was struck by rereading the book was that um, it takes a very long time to to get to the point where it's like I would die for you mm. in a heartbeat. 
eat. Please don't die for me, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, um, so difficult? Sorry, could you say that last bit again? Was the pacing of that difficult to get? Um, not really. Like once I got into the mechanics of what I needed, like in terms of making all the tropes work together, in terms of making the tension work the way that it was supposed to, um, the pacing sort of happened by itself naturally. Um, the only sort of troubling part, uh, and I think that this is a, a valid criticism that uh, many people have brought up, is that the first chapter or two seems quite like there's a lot to take in. There's just a lot to take in. And that's because there were originally like 80 more pages <laughs> in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my editor, bless her soul, was like, nearly 100 pages is too long for us to meet Evermore. Evermore is like so great. Like I need to meet Evermore a lot sooner than that. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's fair. That's very fair. Um, so I think I could have like smoothed out the introduction of all like the different plot lines, um, when I was like condensing 80 pages down into like 20. <laughs> um, but that was, that was the only issue with pacing. Like once I was able to introduce Evamer and like get both of them together, everything else just sort of like fell into place. Gotcha. Um, yeah. it, it's a, it's a great, uh, I'm glad that, that you introduced him as early as you did too, because I, in a way, I mean, I, I love both of them equally. They're my sons, but um, <laughs> uh, I feel like there's, you need more time with Evermer to um, really get to know him because he's mm. difficult in some ways. Yes. I, I think it really depends on the reader. Cause like, I've been, this is one of the really interesting things uh, about like publishing a book that I've been working on for like seven years now. Right. Um, and is, is just like seeing everyone's reaction um, because it seems quite divided in, in like there, there are people who, who understand both of them and who seem to like give, like extend grace to, to both of them and, and patience, like while both of them are sort of like working on growing as people. Um, but like, there's definitely like two distinct factions of like people who find Kado like absolutely intolerable and just and have clearly like never experienced anxiety personally, which I'm congratulations. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I would not wish this on anyone, right? Uh, like I'm, I'm glad that those people are, are out there. Um, and people who find Evamer, so people who find Kado like, like quite, Im, like they're they're quite impatient with him, uh, and people who find Evamer way too harsh on on Kado, um, and so it's it's been really interesting, like watching just sort of like watching that happen, and also like from some of the live blogging and and like tweeting that I've seen, just like watching the process of people having one opinion or the other and then like switching their opinion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the only, the one consistent one that I've seen is that everyone seems to have the same sort of uh, growth process with Tadek, um, which <laughs> is really like the thing that I'm, I'm like celebrating, like, Sure, like, go have your own opinions about, like, whether you like Kato or Evamer better at the beginning. But, like, everybody has the same, like, growth arc with Tadek. And I'm like, yes, I nailed it. <laughs> nailed it. Oh, oh, yes, you did. Because uh, didn't your beta readers say they, like, you cannot kill him off? Yeah, there was, there was, that was also uh, a development towards the the middle it was after the enemies to lovers but before the draft where i was like no they're not going to be exiled to oisos they're just going to stay in arash um and yeah there was a, a draft where tadak got killed off it was um towards the middle of the book i'm not going to say which part but there's a part in the book where tadak um gets mildly injured he gets like sort of stabbed in the side and in the draft where he died that was a much worse um mm injury right. and um but I'm like my my beta readers were absolutely correct they were absolutely correct um it Tadek is is gold and I was very glad to have him in the when I was writing like the second half of the book or like the last third of the book because he right. he provides some much needed levity 
Um, mm-hmm. Because Kato and Evermore are quite like, they're very serious people. Like they're just very serious, like, <laughs> like so in their way of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's a, he's one of those characters that I'm just like, I don't, uh, I don't want anything bad to happen to him because he's so chaotic. Yeah. He makes everything more fun. And I think we need a lot more fun in, in the world and in our narratives and whatnot. Um, I think so. I think so. <laughs> I don't know. Like, especially um, in, in the scene where he, it, Tadek and uh, Tenzin are mm-hmm. together. Tenzin are t- um, just chaos in one. Uh, I'm just like, how could you not lo- love that so? How much? can you not love them? Right, right, right. I mean, and just like, like I think that if if Kado and Evermore were left to their own devices, they would sort of like forget mm-hmm. about the idea that like things can be fun, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to say about them, but it's true. Yes. Well, and. Yeah. I- like neither of them would actually be able to say anything like especially truthful to the other yeah. not someone being like you guys are in love right I, I know you're in love it's fine <laughs> well I, I think that they I think that they would get to a point of being able to speak truthfully to each other but it would be like like very sort of solemn and serious and like laden with with solemn oaths of fealty and and like romance and there wouldn't be like sort of that that reminder like hey if you guys are in love like you can be like enjoying each other's company as well like you can you can be like laughing and telling jokes and this can be like an enjoyable experience he's very he's he's humanizing is what I think he is um because like like I this is another thing like um I think that sometimes we and I'm also guilty of this, right? Like, like I think sometimes we don't let characters be actually like fully fleshed out round people. Um, sometimes they, there's a temptation to make them kind of just like one note people rather than developing them into like, okay, well, what's this person's favorite joke? What's the sort of thing that this person would laugh at? Um, what sort of family relationships does this person have? Because um, those are all part of like what makes a person a person right like there's no one in the world who doesn't ever laugh at anything well maybe there are a couple people but they're they're not as as likable as people as as they would be if they had sort of the full range of human expression and experience yes well yeah like with with evermer i mean he could be he could be your very prototypical stoic yes not fun ever bodyguard but he's also he uh, is very good with babies and he writes to his mother like at least twice a week very long letters too Mm -hmm. like once I heard that I was like okay (laughs) obviously he's amazing (laughs) (laughs) um but then the thing I love too about Tadek from like a more um I guess macro level too is that he's an ex-lover who's allowed Mm to exist in the same space without threatening um the you know the the new relationship and in fact he's uh trying his best to foster that relationship which i think is wonderful because i don't i feel like i don't see that a lot in in fiction um yeah whoever is the enemy or is the dark cloud or whatever and tadak is over here like hey i ship it (laughs) (laughs) yeah like I, i mean i kind of um, I think that's why people initially don't like him very much because like you can, I'm sort of like showing you this archetype of like, okay, well, here's like the flirty sort of ex-boyfriend, maybe not like entirely ex-boyfriend and he's going to be maybe like causing problems or like at least sort of the third point of this love triangle. How is this going to play out? And um, there was a point when I was... Um, towards the end of the the seven drafts I think this was in the last draft uh where I was really considering like okay well do I want to resolve this into like a proper OT3 um because that could be really fun or I could resolve it with like the main pairing and then Tadek over here uh and I was really equally balanced between both of them the reason that I picked the latter was because I, I completely agree with you. I don't see a lot of that in fiction. Like I've seen love triangle resolves to polyamory. I have seen that before. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen a lot of stories about how to stay friends with your ex. 
<laughs> because that's a whole lot harder. Um, and I think that's really part of the queer experience in, in many ways is like, like so many people, so many queer people that I know are still friends with their exes or at least like on speaking terms with their exes. Right. Um, the, yeah. That book, uh, the ex-girlfriend of my ex-girlfriend is my girlfriend or something like that. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and also like, this is a thing that I've been doing a little bit more purposefully since I wrote um, that last draft was that in sort of our society, we put so much weight on romantic and sexual relationships. Mm -hmm. And we kind of have this like unspoken assumption that friendships are lesser right? And that they don't take as much work and that you don't, like, you can just sort of like have friends without actually putting effort into that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to sort of showcase, like, no, you can do friendship intentionally and on purpose. Like you can build that kind of relationship with someone just because you like them. And um, yeah. So just like, like sort of rebalancing and showing that like a friendship can be um, like closer to equal um, in, I mean, in some cases it can be equal. In some cases, the friendship can be more important than the romantic relationship. For Kato, Eva, Mer, and Tadek, I think that like all three of them are okay with like Kato and Eva, Mer, like prioritizing each other. And then Tadek is like hanging out. Like that's kind of where Tadek wants to be. Tadek doesn't really want to be like, like involved or, or committed on that, on that yeah. level. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it puts to my, I mean, my husband has a very dear friend that I call his husband because, you know, when I go to sleep, they're still chatting on the phone, you know, yeah. it, and I think that should be normalized. Uh, you know, it's friendship. I, I can't give right. my husband what this person gives my husband and I'm cool with that, you know? Yeah. Like, like we, none of us, because if, if just one person is the only person that you need, like that's not healthy, that's codependence, right? Like humans, humans are made for having connections with each other. And so putting like actual effort into your community and the connections that you have is like a good thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, um, and it, it also brings to mind uh, some other characters in the story that I, I just, if the character in the story isn't a bad person, I love them because like, uh, when I was text, I think I was texting Parker and I said, the commander is my queen, the, the mm -hmm. sultan is my queen, and also the drunk uh, witch is my queen. And um, like, I just love Sure, this. yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's like with, um, you know, we've got the sultan who is also uh, Kato's sister, but he has a, a, one would say maybe a slightly closer or, or um, what's the word? more intimate relationship with the commander, uh, Eozena, who, Eozena, yep. yeah, yeah, who is um, more like a, an auntie mother figure, whereas, um, you know, his sister has uh, more authority, like a legal authority over him. Um, yeah. I love that. I think that's great because he can seek out different familial connections. Um, and it's not just the one person. It's not monolithic. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Just like different, different kinds of relationships, right? And like, they all come with different sort of like conflicts and frictions. I really like the relationship between Kato and Eozena. Like um, that was also kind of more of a late development. Like they always liked each other, but um, in, in the later drafts that grew keener and keener and it became more and more clear how important they are to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a, a different kind of relationship than any other two characters do in the book. Even Eozna and, and Zeliha, the Sultan, have a different kind of relationship. Um, yeah, and and yeah, I, I love that relationship. You, <laughs> I don't have anything else to say about it. Well, I I mean, I would just say I also love it too. Like I the um there are so many scenes between them where I'm just like, oh my god, that's so cute. Did you what, uh, I hate asking this question really, but what, were any of those incidents between them like pulled from your experience at all? Because it was just so sweet how she was able to get him out of his head and say, oh, you know, I pulled you out of 10 inches of water, young whippersnapper. I, I, uh, 
I, I no, but not really personally. Um, I think again, it was sort of that like a seed of something, and then logical extrapolations from that, and um, and also like the very keen awareness that um, Aozuna is a black woman, and I didn't want to play into like any of the mammy stereotypes or mm -hmm. or anything like that. So I wanted her to be, um powerful and sure of herself and very aware of the fact that she's doing a job but she also this is also like it's a job but it's also a vocation to her and also she does have like very personal um connections to the people who she is in fealty to um she's probably the closest that kato and zeliha have to an equal in the palace other than like a few of the governors um she's definitely the most trusted person in the palace for both of them um and also i think there's the very human kind of experience of like yes she did save kato's life when he was like two years old and that has an effect on people like that's not something you just forget doing either one of you like that's a thread that's always going to bind you together and the fact that she and kato both take that so seriously um, I think they both get a lot out of their relationship with each other, even though there is the disparity both in age between them and also like in rank. Um, but just the fact that they're able to talk to each other as openly and vulnerably as they do. Um, like, I, I think that that's very meaningful for both of them. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I just looked at our Q&A and Ollie um, was chiming in to say, to ask about this character. And then they were like, well, you, you already answered that question. So um, we're, Great. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, and then uh, let me see. Let's talk about uh, ethics. <laughs> really sure. Sexy, sexy Great. Um I mean, it is a sexy topic. I made it a sexy topic. You really did. I mean, the good place tried, but you got it. Mm. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, I, I do think it's wonderful that you engage so um, transparently with it in the story, because in a in a lesser narrative, you could really poke holes in the idea that a prince and a uh, essentially a bodyguard are engaging in a romantic sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but the multiple times throughout the narrative that they um, audibly <laughs> and together reassess their relationship and get on the same page, even if it's difficult sometimes, um, is really wonderful to see. Mm -hmm. uh, and so talk a little bit, if you will, about um, developing that in the narrative. Mm. So, I mean, when you're setting out to write a, like I, the first thing that I knew about this book was that I wanted to write a, like a prince and bodyguard romance, right? Mm -hmm. Cause that's, that's where I live. That's where I live. That's the king of ships for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously like the first question that comes up is okay well how are we navigating power dynamics are we navigating power dynamics or are we just gonna like let the power dynamics be there and it's like forbidden and sexy which is like a valid thing to do um and i decided that like i really like talking about ethics <laughs> and uh at least on and on this level and and when i say ethics i mean the question of how do we treat each other well and what do we owe to each other and how do we behave correctly within a society? Um, what are our responsibilities and what responsibilities can we expect other people to be fulfilling? Um, so all of those questions were sort of ones that I was aware of. And um, I think that this is something, again, that I don't see very much of in, in stories in general, is that when you have a, a good character, like there's always seems to be a point where they're willing to sacrifice their ethics in order to accomplish whatever their goal is. And a lot of the time, the narrative does not confront that. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes an interesting challenge of like, okay, well, what if you do have two characters who are just like welded to their ethics? And like, how do you break them from it eventually? Or do you let them stay welded to their ethics? And if you do, what is the price that they pay 
in order to do that. Um, for example, physical danger. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, like the fact that they're trying to do like they have a pretty good idea like they have suspicions about who the bad guy is the whole the whole way through the book but they're not acting on them because they're not certain beyond a shadow of a doubt right mm -hmm. like like you probably know as the reader because you know the shape of stories like who the bad guy is but when you're actually in that situation in the real world, you're not going to, like, you have to establish probable cause, right? You can't um, just go around pointing the finger at someone and saying, I know you did it, because right, exactly. sets it up, <laughs> you know. Right, like, you need to, you need to go get a warrant, and um, so, yeah, there's, there's all of these, these sort of going through the proper channels and doing things step by step the right way in order to like establish definitively like who do we think did it and what and is that correct and what actually happened um so that's kind of where it was going with the the b plot the fantasy who done it part if if you will um and then with the the relationship part like really confronting like okay what are the power dynamics here um and what are like, how are we navigating that? And one of the things that I really enjoyed doing was that the fact that other people besides the main two characters notice that there's something going on and ask about it and like express concern about like, okay, is this happening in the right way? Um, towards the first, I think, third of the book, there's a scene where Eosna takes Evamur aside to mm -hmm. say, hey, like, you know like what a criminal order is uh, you know that there are like rules in place where you don't have to obey a criminal order especially if it's like someone commanding you to like mm -hmm. do something against your will in sexual contexts like she's part of her job is to protect evamer and so even against Kado, who she has such a close, close relationship to, um, she's taking the time to do her job and to take Evamur aside and say, like, are you okay? Is this situation, like, good? Like, I'm not going to judge you if, if not, but, like, I just need to make sure that you're okay. Yeah. Um, and that, that everything that's happening right now is, is with your consent. Right. Um, yeah. So just like, like awareness of like the real ways in which people act, I think. Yes, absolutely. And it, it only makes me love the characters more because um, I don't, uh, if anyone says it's not sexy to talk about consent and whatnot, they yeah. can just like go, <laughs> you know. Go, go read my hair washing scene and then come back. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh no, we can't talk about the hair washing scene. I had to, I had to put the, um, well, I was reading on my laptop at the time. I had to walk away from it for a bit. Like, oh, yes. <laughs> it was so good. But the whole time they're, yeah, talking, we're doing about, this. Yeah. <laughs> the whole time they're talking about, you know, ethics and whatnot and Evermer's not thinking about it, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is my favorite thing ever <laughs> that it, it made so much sense when I later learned that he's a virgin because I'm like, oh my gosh, this poor little baby. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what's going on. I mean, it, like, and he's he's a virgin and also like he's demisexual and which is like a whole, and then like I'm demisexual as well. And so like, there's a whole sort of like category of like relationship stuff that I'm just like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, like other people seem to just like get it and I like don't. Um, it yeah. shrinks the percentage of people that you would be even focused right. on in the first place. Right, so right, right. Never probably, well, he, he experienced this, what, once beforehand? Poor yes. thing. You know, it's, it takes a while. Um, it takes but, a while. And he also has just a very specific type is the other problem. <laughs> so specific. I love the moment when um, Zelia does her thing and he's like, oh. Well, <laughs> like he just has a little moment of he thinks about it for a second oh yeah he does and I can't blame him because she's amazing <laughs> especially she's when she's pretty. like just suddenly the sultan and she's like you do this you do that you do that and I'm like yes I'll do mm -hmm. whatever you think 
Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. We have to talk about, well, I really want to talk about fan fiction. Okay. <laughs> um, because you dedicated this book to people who write fan fiction, I think, or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, fan fiction writers. Yep. Yep. Uh, I have been, and I'm a, a 34 year old woman, I'm an adult, and I love reading fan fiction. And I have read it for eons. I have a tab saved on my phone just for when I, I need like an infusion of happiness. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, from your perspective, what, what is so amazing about fan fiction? Obviously I know, but. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, like I have four years worth of a podcast called Be the Serpent, which was nominated for four Hugos, um, <laughs> um, all about like the the importance of fan fiction and like uh, like fan fiction's role in the broader literary conversation. Um, I don't know that it's something that I can I can sum up in like one sort of quick answer, but um, the fact that like like. Part of it, and this is just like one factor of it, is that it all comes back to capitalism, right? Like telling stories is a thing that humans do. Uh, writing fan fiction is something that humans have done since we invented stories, right? Um, like it's when you're confronted with a character who means something to you, you just start imagining other stories for them. And this is how we get um, like the vast variety of myths and folklore, I knew we would come back to it eventually, uh, right? Like, like when, like, there's all different stories about Loki, right? And it wasn't just one person who came up with all of the stories about Loki. It was like a whole culture over hundreds or possibly thousands of years who built this up and one person would come up with a new Loki story. Probably bunches and bunches of people came up with new Loki stories all the time uh, or new Anansi stories or new uh, stories about Apollo. Um, and some of them were really, really good and they survived and got variations and some of them were not as good or just weren't told to the right people and so they sort of petered out um but it's it's a natural human sort of process to tell stories like this and to to um engage with our mythology in that way um, and then you have capitalism come along and you put barbed wire fences around um the the concept of ownership of stories and who is allowed to tell stories about these characters um and like we can the whole discussion of copyright is a completely different um discussion because on one hand as a professional author like I love copyright copyright like protects my livelihood um but on the other hand like we can recognize that it is a symptom of capitalism and so fan fiction is a way of practicing those very human kinds of processes mm -hmm. um, with the mythologies that are immediately relevant to us right now um, in order to like express whatever we're trying to express within ourselves. Yes. Wonderful. I think that's, you did a very good job of boiling that down because I mean, thanks. because <laughs> it's, it's difficult, but you know, people don't think about it until you point out like um, the Aeneid is mm -hmm. And Dante's the Bible is fan fiction, right? Like, yes, yes, yes. And it's um, it's kind of wild to me at some points that I have to sort of explain to people that just because now we call it fan fiction, we used to just call it something else. But it's always been literature. Around. We used to just call it literature, you know. <laughs> um, like, and even even like like all of the consider it philosophy, right? Like the whole field of philosophy. Um, it's just a conversation, right? All of the philosophers read each other's work and then they have thoughts about that. And so they write their own thoughts down and publish that. And this is one long conversation that started, we'll say around Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, because that's usually where we start with philosophy as like a subject matter. Um, and then it has been a conversation that has gone on for centuries, millennia since then, right? Um, and fan fiction is kind of the same way because that's also 
engaging in a conversation and reading someone else's work and then having thoughts about it, writing it down and expressing it yourself and, and publishing it to the masses. Um, yeah. Well, I um, thank you for boiling it down to that too, because I really, yeah. feel like, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's also a great way to, yeah, to continue that conversation to um, keep these stories fresh in some way, and also to show that the story continues to have value, and it's mm -hmm. not something that like it's been printed and that's all there is to it. You know, there are so many books out there, so many TV shows and whatnot that we could still talk about. Um, kind of brings me back to the Good Place, actually, of like um, that's a show where you know we we have so much more we could still probably say about it. Even if the yeah. show's gone, that doesn't mean it's over. Um, I have had so much fun talking to you, and I probably could talk to you for a very long time about because I have so much. I wanted to compliment you and talk about the uh, the action sequences in this book. There are not very many of them, but I love how they're written. Um, Thank you. But uh, I just need to stop myself <laughs> and just say thank you. Um, thank you for writing this book. And uh, I would love to ask you if you um, are planning on revisiting any of these characters at some point, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> I know you're working um, yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot of things up in the air right now. I, I certainly love these characters. I am on deadline for a couple other very exciting things um, right now. So obviously that gets priority and like, yeah, publishing industry stuff, you know, like everything's up in the air, who knows? Um, I, it's something that I would certainly be open to in the future, but like a lot depends on stuff is <laughs> kind of like what all of the publishing industry boils down to. A lot depends on stuff. Um, yeah, uh, but like I like I said, um, all of my all of my fantasy books are set in the same world, and so even if you don't necessarily see these same characters, I'm sure that um, you'll at least hear familiar names for places and cultures. Um, in the next book that I'm writing, like there is another character from Arashd, uh, so we will get a little bit more of of that from from that character. Amazing. Well, uh, here's me going on a deep dive into reading all of your previous books, and of course, I'll be uh, very uh, highly anticipating whatever comes next. Um, thank thank you. you so much for your time. And sure, uh, can I just tell people where to find me if they have any more questions, Absolutely. real quick? Cool. So um, I'm on Twitter as at underscore Alex Rowland. Um, I have an official Discord server, which is linked on my website, uh, alexandraroland.net. Um, or you can uh, feel free to email me if you have any other questions or anything else that you want to say about the book. Um, I'm friendly. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. Absolutely. Uh, thank cool. you so much. Uh, once again, I say that too much, but um, and to everybody who's watching, uh, we wouldn't have a bookstore without you and without wonderful authors. So um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye, thanks everyone. for having me. And thanks for everyone who, who showed up to listen.